Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening uh, to all participants in this uh, webinar on children's rights to privacy and data protection in Africa. Uh, you're all welcome, and we're looking forward to having a great session with a panel uh, uh, that has a lot of experience across the various topics that we have selected for this great webinar. In moderation, it will be two of us, uh, my colleague, Klingiwe, and myself. She'll introduce herself when uh, she comes on. But for me, from the Children's Rights Unit and the Center for Human Rights, we are pleased to, to welcome all of you. Without much ado, we will move straight to the, the program because we really, really want to have a lot of conversation around this issue. And uh, because we see that we have so many colleagues across the continent and beyond, that we also want to use the time judiciously uh, that we have assigned for this, for this webinar. To start and to open, I will invite my colleague, the Assistant Director of the Center for Human Rights, Dr. Nkata Murungi, to give us an, an, an opening or welcome to all of us to this webinar. Dr. Murungi is an established researcher in children's rights issue governance. She has a lot of experience across the continent, principally worked across the continent in different countries, and has also published a lot of scientific work around this area. So, we are blessed as a center and as a unit, Children's Rights Unit, to have someone of this nature next to us and uh, will continuously contribute to the work that, that we do. I will pass over to Dr. Murungi to give us uh, an opening. Uh, thank you, Elvis. Um, good, okay. I should say greetings everyone because I understand that we are joining from different areas. So greetings everyone and welcome come to this um, webinar. We are very excited as a center to host this, this webinar. Um, we've had a couple of events previously on this, but just to reiterate that this is really, <clears throat> um, it's an exciting time for us to welcome you all again uh, to join us for today. Um, this particular webinar focuses on privacy, the pri privacy rights of children in the digital sphere. It's a very specific area of focus, but um, I think I don't even need to say so much in relation to how much recent developments in technology have shaped and continue to shape uh, the human rights discourse, not just in Africa, but in Africa and beyond. And because of that, how uh, timely this conversation is, and not just timely, but also um, necessary uh, for us to be having these discussions um, disengagements on what the implications of technological developments, including digital technology on, um, on human rights more generally, but on children's rights uh, specifically in this case. Uh, within the African region, um, the, this is not, it's not the first time that we are uh, talking about the implications of technology, but it's a conversation that has gained momentum. And so we also, as part of the human rights and the children's rights uh, uh, the community of practice have a stake in understanding what the implications are, uh, contributing to how we can anticipate uh, the changes and the, 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 the evolving reality of children's lives um, in, in interaction with technology. And so this is part of that wider conversation around technology and human rights um, and the nexus between technology and children's rights in particular. Um, when you say technology, it's definitely um, referencing a wider scope of capabilities that goes beyond digital technology. Of course, today we are talking about the digital sphere um, and there are implications to that in terms of online connectivity, use of digital media um, and that particular space. But we understand that technology spans further uh, than, um, than the, um, the digital sphere. And we are having other influences on human rights that are, human, that are technology based and which of course we at different times we might apply our minds to such as advancements in the fields of say medicine, uh, science um, that have direct implications for, for people's lives and therefore for human rights. But from a digital point of view or digital technology point of view, there's a lot more that has to do with communication, issues to do with uh, privacy, issues to do with 
um, uh, management of information. And so some of some, those are some of the conversations that might be coming up, not ignoring um, wider context, things like, for instance, currently the very ripe discussion around the fourth industrial revolution and its implications for human rights, for children's rights in fields, again, such as education, healthcare, um, access to information and things like that. So as you can see, there is quite a huge scope of what we could be dwelling on um, in the course of today. But like I said, we have within a short time to delimit our conversations to a specific issue. And therefore we are looking at privacy rights and uh, digital, digital technology. Um, in short, this, this is a, a conversation that is happening in a very specified context, a very delimited uh, scope but which we are hoping that you, you will be able to see in a wider, um, from, from a wider spectrum because we intend to continue with the discussion beyond today. And uh, just to, to mention that um, it, the, the, today's uh, webinar is part of the center's work around um, technology and human rights. The center has been hosting a campaign called uh, Tech for Rights campaign. The Tech for Rights campaign is basically um, every year the center hosts a particular campaign and this campaign we've been running since 2020 and this year is supposed to draw attention to the interaction of technology and human rights. And so we, within that context is where we are having today's conversation, but we are inviting you to also look up, engage with the campaign. We have some materials on our website, on our social media, and you will see the various other aspects of uh, human rights interaction with technology and uh, we hope that you can contribute and we can be able to engage with you um, on some of these issues. Uh, so to welcome you basically um, from our end, I would just want to say that this also links to a webinar we had last year again on children's rights in the digital sphere. You can uh, reference that webinar, it's also on our website, but um, that we are doing this within a wider context of looking at how the African region is responding to children's rights in a digital sphere or in the evolving context of digital technology. We are very happy to have you. And on behalf of the center, I really want to appreciate your time and your contributions and um, to appreciate the wonderful panel that we have ahead of us and hope that for the next um, one and a half hours that we have this conversation, we will all be able to learn and engage and um, benefit from the conversation. Welcome. Thank you. Elvis? Thank you, well. Um, thank you, Elvis. Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Murungi. My name is Klenge Wadube. I am also a best of the Center for Human Rights. Um, I am in the Expression, Information and Digital Rights um, Unit as, as the manager of the unit. So our work uh, revolves around issues on freedom of expression, access to um, information and also digital rights um, in general. And one of the areas that uh, we work on uh, issues of privacy and, uh, and data protection. And I'm glad that today, um, as a unit, we are um, working with the Children's Rights Unit uh, to advance the cause of uh, the right to privacy in, um, in the context of, of children. So um, you have already been introduced uh, to the subject of the day and also the and welcomed by um, our Assistant Director, um, Dr. Murungi. I'm going to um, start off the conversation of, of the day by welcoming our first speaker. And our first speaker is somebody who is not new to us, to um, participants that are attending this, um, this uh, webinar today. Our first speaker is uh, Pro uh, Professor Julia Sloth Nelson. She is uh, a professor at the University of the Western Cape, and she's a, a professor of children's rights in the developing world at Leiden University in the Netherlands. I mean, you have seen the work that Prof. Julia has, has published well over 150 um, chapters and articles on various aspects of, of children's rights. And she has also supervised um, 
students at PhD level and also um, at master's level. Uh, she has also been a member of the Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child uh, between 2011 and 2016, and has also worked um, on child uh, law reform in, in many countries and uh, is currently working on projects in Ethiopia, in, in, in Mozambique, um, and also in Sri Lanka. Um, we are really are delighted to have you, Prof. Julia, on, on, on today's program, and uh, we welcome you. So um, Prof. Julia is going to address us on um, the overview of the laws relating to children's rights to privacy um, and data protection on the continent in Africa, particularly looking at, at the digital sphere. Over to you, Prof. Julia. Thank you. Thank you, Lindy, for those kind words. I'm just going to take a second to share screen. Um, okay. Um, morning, everybody, and welcome from all of the quarters of the continent. Um, and many languages that I see also in the chat room. My, my presentation today is not a, a generic one. It's based on a report that I was commissioned to write by the Center for Human Rights, Baitlangiwe and uh, Carter and Albus. Um, and I want to just share some of the overarching considerations and background to the report. And then when I finish in Carter or Elvis or Klingiwe, will be able to uh, indicate to the audience um, the extent to which this report is going to be in, in the public eye and available for anybody who wants to read it, which I'm not entirely sure about at this stage. So the, the back, background context is that um, although <laughs> um, smartphone penetration currently stands at below 50% in most African countries, there are notable examples of places where there has been a huge increase in smartphone penetration. And some figures are given to you on this slide. Internet penetration as at March 2020 uh, stood already at nearly 40%. And in a few countries like Ghana and South Africa, smartphone and internet penetration seem to go hand in hand. But for other countries, such as Kenya, Nigeria, and Senegal, internet penetration is way ahead of smartphone pen penetration. The so things are developing unevenly in different places from the continent, but the old general trajectory is one of vastly increased access. So as a backdrop to the report, um, the center commissioned country reviews, not every single country in Africa, but 19 country reviews were completed, um, four for North Africa, for six for West Africa, two for Central Africa, five for Eastern Africa, and four for Southern Africa. And I had developed a questionnaire, um, which was sent to the teams that undertook these country reviews, so that there was a degree of uniformity in the information that came back. And the topics included in this questionnaire included um, the law, as has been mentioned, for instance, laws relating to children, laws relating to data protection, uh, whether there was a regulatory authority or authorities. There was a section relating to regulation of advertising and marketing um, insofar as it relates to children. And then where I could find case law, which I was able to from Tunisia, from Tanzania, from South Africa, um, uh, cases dealing with jurisprudence or judicial protection and remedies. And then the report starts with um, the concept of privacy as a right. Um, because privacy, although one finds it mentioned in most uh, international treaties, starting with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it is actually quite a complex uh, right, because originally it was focused much more on protection of one's correspondence and communications from interception, but it has a much, much wider remit now. And everybody is in agreement that the concept of privacy is context specific. 
So privacy, what you would want to share with your parents or your teachers is not the same as, as the kind of things you as a child would want to share with friends, for example. So it can be organization specific, it can be uh, person specific, um, and there are um, many different examples of what people do and do not regard as being part of their privacy or their inner sanctum. And it varies across cultures and it varies from person to person. One person might be more sensitive about the potential of invasion of privacy than another person. So the major harm context that lie behind most privacy discussions in children's rights relate to strangers trying to sexually solicit or groom youth, receiving inappropriate sexual Im images, also known as sexting, bullying, threats, or harassment, um, the fear of having one's computer hacked or valuable software or even money is stolen um, through privacy invasion, being manipulated by technology companies or commercial enterprises, being spied upon by law enforcement agencies, school authorities or government agencies, and thus being made vulnerable to possible sanctions or to discrimination and having one's reputation damaged in the eyes of family and friends by having unwarranted information shared to damage one's reputation. Um, so the, the issues that are also discussed in the report are the growing use of automated data processing, profiling, behavioral targeting, mandatory identity verification, information filtering, and mass surveillance, which are becoming increasingly routine, routine and which may lead to arbitrary or unlawful interference with children's rights to privacy. And the available evidence um, from the reports that I consulted uh, indicate that commercial privacy is the area where children are least able to comprehend the invasion and to manage to control this on their own. But privacy is also vital for child development and key privacy related media literacy skills are closely associated with a range of important child developmental areas, the development of autonomy, the development of one's identity, the furtherance of intimacy, responsibility, trust, pro-social behavior, resilience, critical thinking and sexual exploration. Um, threats to uh, one's privacy may come from parents, peers, educators, strangers. It may come from data collection by public institutions, businesses, and hacking and identity theft. It may come from automated processes, behavior targeting, and strong regulation, and access to remedies is required, particularly in public settings, to ensure protection. Now, it's important to talk a little bit about autonomy because many of the discussions about, about privacy are very focused on child protection from all of the threats that I mentioned, but particularly sexual predators. Um, whereas very little is focused on, or much less is focused on the idea of children's developing autonomy. And it also raises the issue of consent and how and when children can consent to their personal data being collected and used. Um, in the report, I refer um, to the General Data Protection Regulation of the EU, which I'm sure other speakers will also refer to, because this is serving as a benchmark in some African states um, for the development of local data protection laws. Uh, and Nigeria is cited as an example. And as I say, these are based on the country reports that the center had commissioned. There's also been a call for some African countries to update their laws uh, because of the 2018 GDPR, whereas their laws predate this and are based on uh, previous um, uh, OECD guidelines of 1980s. So there's a question about relevance in the modern era. Turning to the applicable um, international law framework, 
Um, it's important to start with the Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child, which, like so many other international human rights treaties, does guarantee children's rights to privacy, but formulated slightly differently from that in the CRC, because it provides that parents or legal guardians shall have the right to exercise reasonable supervision over the conduct of their children, which seems to indicate that parents or legal guardians can interfere with children's rights to privacy and they don't have an autonomous right in this regard. But the African Committee of Experts has made it clear that violations of the rights of the child, including privacy, cannot simply be justified, justified by the phrase supervision over the conduct of the child. But there is nevertheless a parental obligation to provide guidance to their children in digital literacy. Now, at the risk of overlapping with other speakers today, I think it's also important to note the very recent March 2021 release of the general comments of the Committee on the Rights of the Child, which has been some years in the making. And quite a lot of this general comment, which is of course relevant to this continent insofar as every African state has ratified the CRC, this general comment has quite a lot um, dealing with privacy, which I do cover in full in the report. But just to summarize a few issues on this slide in the next one, in addition to developing legislation and policy, state parties should require all frameworks, industry codes, and terms of services to adhere to the highest standard of ethics, privacy, and safety. This is a quote, obviously, in relation to the design, engineering, development, operation, distribution, and marketing of their products and services. And that includes businesses that target children, have children as end users, or otherwise affect children. Further, that interference with the child's privacy is only permissible if it is neither arbitrary nor unlawful. So any such interference should be provided for by law, should be intended to serve a legitimate purpose, uphold the principle of data minimization, be proportionate and designed to observe the best interests of the child. It should not arbitrarily limit, limit children's other rights, such as their right to freedom of expression or their right to protection. Now, also uh, in the uh, legal and regulatory environment, as you probably are all aware, the AU Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection was adopted in 2014, but it has not been very widely ratified. Um, only 14 out of the 55 member states um, have signed the convention and only eight have ratified. Um, and then there are also regional frameworks. Uh, that one finds in the SADC, in East Africa, and in ECOWAS. So there's growing guidance on what needs to be done that is coming from children's rights and continental bodies. Now, the report found that the legal uh, environment is generally quite weak. In some cases, it's completely non-existent as regards children's rights. Sometimes it's based on very outdated definitions of child pornography or possession or premises, which ignores the fact that there might be non-physical environments like chat rooms and weak evidentiary tools and laws. Um, government regulation of internet services providers is not always in place or it's not optimal and, <coughs> and um, state parties have difficulty sometimes in holding transnational multinationals to account and I do give one or two examples of that in the report. Only 11 African countries have data protection regulators in place, although 29 have data protection laws. So there's an issue here around implementation and around resourcing of these structures, which I hope will be picked up by some other speakers. Um, there are a few good examples in Africa of control of digital marketing of commercial products to children, e.g. in the context of automated decisions by, for instance, algorithms. And also there are some emerging good examples 
of the collection and distribution of personal information uh, being prevented. And I, I don't want to single out any country because the countries that are mentioned in the report are in fact quite voluminous, but I've just given an example here of Uganda, which adopted new law in 2019. And here's some more examples um, of emerging legislation. Kenya um, has a raft of regulations that, are, that have been developed uh, based on the 2019 Data Protection Act. Um, I mentioned also Uganda, the 2019 Act, which is the primary privacy and data protection law. In Zimbabwe, there's a cybersecurity and data protection bill which was gazetted on the 15th of May. And these are only three recent examples. There are others, and I don't necessarily want to focus only on Eastern and Southern Africa because there are examples from other regions as well. Um, turning to uh, child protection or children's rights laws, most countries have by this stage a children's code or a children's act. Um, and so one of the briefs to the research team was to go and see to what extent uh, privacy rights feature in those. Generally speaking, uh, they, children, children's rights to privacy might be recognized as a principle, but it's not in any way linked to the specificities of the digital environment. So the main laws that one has to actually consider are those related to data protection. And there are very few examples of provisions which directly address um, <clears throat> um, which directly address uh, children's privacy protection um, and especially with regard to the digital environment. And the examples I've given on this particular screen are firstly the children's code or the child code of Benin. Um, and <clears throat> I give the entire uh, provision that has been included um, in the Code of Benin. And then I also refer to recent amendments that are still winding their way through Parliament in relation to South Africa's Children's Act, which is going to beef up the linkage between the Children's Act and, as you can see, um, other legislation that deals with the protection of privacy and of personal information. <laughs> the Kenyan example, um, it's got fairly comprehensive provisions relating to children, for instance, relating to consent. And I've given you the uh, applicable provision on the, in the middle paragraph there. And in Nigeria, the National Data Protection Implementation Framework classes a child as under 13 for the purposes of internet services, which was based on the US Children's Online Protection Act and which is written into the membership policies of most social media platforms. I'm going to skip the next one. <clears throat> the next section of, of the report looks at other policy developments, um, particularly relating to education and awareness. Many countries um, have, particularly in very recent times, um, <clears throat> adopted initiatives to raise awareness and to educate the general public and children about digital issues, some of it with the assistance of service providers like UNICEF or Internet Watch Foundation or Childline. And I've given examples related to uh, Egypt, where there's actually a multi-stakeholder national child online protection committee. Um, in Kenya, with the Ministry of Education in 2020, uh, launched a... Um, <coughs> a um, with the approval of the Department of Curriculum Development, a series of manuals for training on child online safety. Um, the uh, next example comes from um, Senegal. Um, and, and the one after that, I think, comes from, sorry, my printout is very small for me to read, I've tried. Uh, sorry, the, the next example was Tunisia. And then I've also given the example um, on the next slide of uh, Senegal, which um, <clears throat> has one of the main priorities in the National Digital Strategies Action Plan, a program called Reinforcing Child Protection Online. Now, one of the very few country reports I did ask about this 
Uh, the fact that games are increasingly online, and that obviously is something which implicates children's rights to rest, leisure, play, and recreation. But the, one of the very few reports to include any information about games was the one from Zimbabwe, which reports that the child online safety guidelines include a whole section on uh, playing games online and they encourage children to be mindful of how much they play, who they play with, and they further encourage children to protect their privacy and not share their personal information with other gamers. The next section of the report, as I mentioned at the beginning, deals with advertising and marketing. And I think the main finding here is that for the most part, um, advertising and marketing are a matter of self-regulation. And I've given the example of a code of advertising practice in Kenya, the Media Council of Tanzania, which has a code of ethics for media professionals. Uh, and there are guidelines on <coughs> specifically that are specifically relevant to children. So children should not be exploitatively used in advertisements that concern adults. They should not be exposed to harmful products. There should be restrictions on content prohibiting the, any portal of violence or aggression in advertisements aimed at children. Advertisements with menacing or horrific themes, unsafe acts, pictures or sounds likely to disturb children or that encourage antisocial behavior are also prohibited. And then a last example in Nigeria also, the advertising code has specific provisions relating to products or services aimed at children. <laughs> um, those that are unsuitable for children should be clearly identified in the message subject line. Products unsuitable for children cannot be advertised during children's programs. Parental consent is required for choosing children's identifiable information, disclosing children's identifiable information. And parents and guardians are encouraged to participate in and or supervise and monitor children's activities. So that gives an overview of this, of this report, um, which, as I say, uh, covers uh, quite a few countries in Africa and a range of of legal environments, including cybercrime, data protection, children's acts, and advertising and marketing. So what's, what are the takeaways from the report as a whole? Um, I identified eight um, recommendations for moving forward. First, that one needs to continue to gain a deeper understanding of the meaning of children's rights to privacy in the African context. And as I said, it might not be the same in all contexts throughout the continent, but one does need to look at the developing uh, nature of children's digital engagement, uh, how that's taking place and what that means for children's rights to privacy. Um, I do re recommend that the ratification of applicable regional instruments take place and that legislation that is out of date, there were several countries whose legislation dates back 15 years or more, that, that must clearly be out of date and it needs to be reviewed. It's said that there isn't a greater attention to privacy in the children's codes or children's acts that I mentioned, and this is something for uh, consideration. I recommend that, that uh, the, there be track kept of any available jurisprudence uh, and the array of potential remedies for rights violations. Um, I would recommend that maybe the center could adopt this as a project. We're not dealing with thousands of cases at this point, but it's interesting to see the different cases that have arisen, the few different cases that have arisen in different contexts um, <clears throat> on the continent. And then finally, the need for ongoing education for children and their parents on digital citizenship. And here I may say that it may be that there's no need to reinvent the wheel if there are good practices and programs that have been developed elsewhere on the continent, then these could provide the basis for local absorption. So I'm very also interested in any further conclusions that emanate from this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you for that overview of the report that you have indicated. And as uh, Dr. Moringi indicated that as a center, we. Uh, have positioned ourselves or continuously positioned ourselves uh, to gather a lot of information around uh, 
uh, students' interaction with uh, internet and uh, the protection that comes from that environment. So we have we have a growing responsibility on this information, and the question that you asked from the beginning about the availability of this of this report, the continuation of this report will be answered uh, duly after the webinar because we have done some work on it. We have looked at it, and we will get back to you so that we get the report the attention that it deserves. We will now proceed to the next speaker. <clears throat> The next speaker, for those of us who've been around the continent, <laughs> around children's rights advocacy in the continent is not anyone new. But for this webinar, we are very pleased to see you again. And that's uh, uh, Luis Holy. Luis is a policy and advocacy uh, specialist with 16 years experience of promoting children's rights, uh, following roles with uh, Save the Children and UNICEF. And I think UNICEF in particular, that is where most of us interacted with you in the continent back in the years. But now Louise works with an independent consultant. Uh, she's currently supporting the Secretariat of Lancet Commission and looking at children and young people's health and well-being in relation to digital technologies and advises uh, civil societies or a civil society a coalition on digital health called Transform Health. Through these and other roles, she has conducted extensive research and policy analysis or policy analysis, analysis on children's rights in the digital age. Louise is based in the UK and uh, has a BA honors in philosophy from King's College and an MS in history and international relations from London School of Economics. Louise, from my end, and of course, I'm sure that uh, several, many of us will echo the same sentiment. We are pleased to have you on this webinar and we look forward to listening to your presentation on the European experience on issue of child rights, privacy and data protection. You have 10 minutes, thank you. All right, uh, thank you Elvis for the really generous and kind introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here with you all today. Um, I'm just gonna try and share my screen. No, that's not the right one. Let me... Uh, can I just check? Can you see my slides? Can anyone confirm? Yes, yes we can. Okay, great. I was worried, get worried it's not going to work. But um, yeah, thank you very much again for inviting me to be part of this webinar. Um, just to add a bit more background into sort of where I come from. Um, I worked, as Elvis said, um, with UNICEF in Addis Ababa for a number of years. So I had the opportunity to work closely with many of you who were involved with the African Committee of Experts and the Africa Union. Um, and then when I returned back to the UK a few years ago, I started working um, on a number of projects that were related to children's rights in the digital age, um, specifically in relation to the intersection between digital transformations and health. So as um, Elvis mentioned, I'm currently working with a Lancet commission called Governing Health Futures 2030, growing up in a digital world. And so I've been able to sort of draw on my sort of background in sort of children's rights and also working on global health to um, support the commission in terms of thinking through the opportunities and risks around children's health data specifically. Um, and we've also been looking at um, how potential rights violations in the digital environment can harm children's health and well-being. So as I'm sure many of you know very well, um, health data and the privacy around health data is particularly important because it's very sensitive form of data, but also because lots of people want that kind of data. It's very valuable to both researchers and companies um, and is being collected, um, including by those who have no interest in using it to support public good and, and children's rights. So, um, I was also going to say a little bit about general comment 25, but I don't need to now because Professor Sloth Nielsen already introduced that. But um, just to reiterate, as she said, that this new general comment, which came out just a few months ago, contains lots of guidance for member states all around the world in relation to children's privacy in the digital environment and other rights in the digital environment. 
but maybe I will use this opportunity to just kind of emphasize that um, lots of children were consulted in the development of that general comment. And I would encourage any of you to, to look at the report here, which is a summary of what children think about their rights in the digital world. And just to highlight a few um, points that children from all regions of the world made in relation to privacy, um, so sort of general conclusions were that they agree that the right to privacy is critical in the digital age, but they actually really value the privacy that they can get through interacting in online spaces. And these sort of provide them with lots of opportunities to express themselves and um, explore their identity. Um, and as Professor Sloth Nielsen also mentioned, you know, for children, often the immediate priority is around interpersonal privacy, so privacy in relation to their family and those who are closest to them. Um, and increasingly they're becoming sort of more um, aware and concerned around privacy in relation to sort of those who are outside their household, whether that's schools, government, commercial companies, for example. And um, across all kind of countries at the different income levels, children are increasingly becoming aware of the, sort of the practices of commercial entities who are collecting their data. Um, and they want to know more about how their data is being collected and how it's stored and how it's used. Um, and interestingly, I found from this report that um, children were generally more positive about the, 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 the role of governments in terms of using their data. Um, compared to private companies, they felt that governments were going to use their data more likely to <clears throat> make their lives better. Um, so now I'm going to move into um, sharing some perspectives and examples of work that's being carried out in the European continent. Um, and like Africa, it's a sort of diverse um, continent made up of lots of different countries and cultures. Um, but there are some differences in terms of the context. Um, coverage of mobile phone and broadband internet um, generally across European countries is very high. Um, on average, uh, more than nine out of 10 European children will be able to access the internet on, in their household. Um, and there are um, differences in terms of, you know, reduced costs of accessing int uh, the internet, availability of devices. There are obviously differences and digital divide within European countries, but to a large extent, um, children have had, you know, maybe a decade already now of um, very extensive exposure to the online environment. But despite that, um, from what I've found anyway, that the focus on children's rights in the digital age has only really sort of taken um, set center stage in the last five years or so. Um, some scholars, some of which I'm sure you know of, like um, Sonia Livingston, um, Amanda Third, Laura Lundy, Garrison Landdown, are among those who've been writing about this topic um, within the European and global context um, for a number of years now, and they, they were all very much involved in the development of that general comment. Um, so the, the right to privacy and the right to data protection are ensured both within the Council of Europe and within the European Union. So just to sort of say the difference between those, the Council of Europe is a regional organization that's made up of 47 European member states and it's been established since um, 1949. And its primary role is around the protection and promotion of human rights and democracy and law. Um, and the European Union is a, a sort of regional economic and political organization that now has uh, 27 members. So there are members of both the European Union and the Council of Europe. So to start with the Council of Europe, um, individual rights to privacy, which apply to both adults and children, um, are enshrined in a number of documents. The European Convention on Human Rights um, it includes uh, provisions on the right to privacy. Um, and that is um, the right to data protection is a, a subset of that. Um, and there's another convention around the protection of individuals with regard to processing of personal data, which was updated in 2018, which um, calls on member states to pay specific attention to the data protection rights of children. 
Um, I think also worth mentioning about the Council of Europe is if over the past um, number of years, the Council of Europe has been paying quite a lot of attention to um, children's rights in the online environment as far back as 2008. Um, but 2014 um, came around sort of a recommendation um, and a guide for Council of Europe members on human rights for internet users, followed quite soon by a strategy for the rights of the child and some more guidelines on protecting and respecting children's rights in the digital environment. And all of these instruments acknowledge the importance of protecting children's rights, privacy and data protection. And whilst these are non-binding, they provide a very clear framework and guidance for European member states. And a new strategy for the rights of the child is, um, I believe, currently under development. Um, moving quickly on, because I know I don't have much time, to the European Union. Um, Professor Sloth Nielsen already mentioned, you know, this important piece of legislation, the General Data Protection uh, Regulation, which um, has been in force since 2018. Um, and this includes, um, and so interestingly, the GDPR doesn't actually use the word privacy or pr private specifically within any of its articles, but the protection of the right to privacy or private life is inherent within the different articles within it. Um, it does give um, acknowledgement of the specific need of protection of personal data of children. Um, and this, the work of the, GD, the GDPR um, is being implemented um, with the sort of collaboration of a number of different initiatives. There's um, a European Data Protection Board, which was established alongside the GDPR, um, that sort of issued lots of guidance around um, uh, member states not uh, profiling uh, or allowing the profiling of children and the use of data for harmful, potentially marketing uh, purposes, for example. Um, there's an e-privacy directive that was meant to come into effect alongside the GDPR, but has been delayed because of significant lobbying um, around this directive. Um, the latest draft from just a few months ago uh, does not include any specific references to children, but does make general, uh, reference to general um, provisions around children's privacy. Um, so just to quickly comment that a number of scholars have expressed concern about the fragmented a fragmented landscape that may be emerging across the European continent. Um, and this, for one reason, this is because the GDPR um, sort of has some uh, provisions around, as you can see here, um, processing of children's data uh, below the age of 16, but allows member states to um, have their um, own provisions as long as it doesn't go below 13 years of age, which is also in line, I think, with the, the US legislation that was mentioned earlier. So there's lots of issues around, you know, across the continent and uh, digital service providers based around the continent, um, concerns around which children are protected under which, under which jurisdictions. Um, just to say a last thing about the European Union, they've also this year developed a, a strategy on the rights of the child. Um, and one of the six priorities of that is around the digital and information society, and it includes specific recommendations to EU member states and to ICT companies around children's uh, rights to protection, uh, to privacy and data protection. Uh, and finally, I just thought it was worth sharing that there are a number of interesting research initiatives um, taking place across the European continent. So I'd invite you to look at both of those, but they've been very informative in terms of capturing the lived experiences and the views of children across the continent in relation to internet use. I'll try and speed up. I know I'm going a bit um, over time, but just to say a few things specifically um, about the UK, which is where I'm from. Some initiatives I thought were um, quite unique potentially and um, may you know, be some practices that could be replicated. So the first one is around an age appropriate design code, which I believe is the first in the world. It's a code of practice for online services that sets out specific protections that children require for their data. And it um, suggests a very, very high bar of data protection for children by default. 
Um, and it's going to, it came into force um, in September last year and um, digital com uh, service providers and companies have until September this year to conform with it. And it was developed in consultation with children. So what you can see here is a sort of child friendly version of the age appropriate design code. Um, it was developed um, very much um, with the CRC as its basis and it supports compliance of the GDPR. Uh, the UK government is also developing an online safety bill. A draft bill was published um, a couple of months ago. Um, it's been under development for a couple of years and it's very much geared at keeping children safe online. Um, and it includes a number of provisions on um, children's privacy, um, applying to all services that are likely to be accessed by children um, under the age of 18. And then just a final initiative from the UK that I wanted to share was um, work of a children's commissioner for England specifically. Um, I know a number of countries now have children's commissioners, um, but the one for England has um, got uh, digital um, children's rights in the digital environment as a sort of specific priority work stream. And a number of reports that have come out recently around children's data protection um, have generated a lot of media coverage and interest in the UK and the Children's Commissioner has a particularly unique a role in terms of holding the government to account um, for implementing things like the GDPR and this age appropriate design code. So I think it's a really important position within the UK that's enabling children's rights in the digital age to gain even more prominence. So just in closing, because um, I've had to go through things very quickly, I've just got some um, sources here for further information, which I can share with Elvis and he can pass on if people are interested. Um, and just to conclude that many of the initiatives um, and approaches that and legislation that I've just presented have really only come about in the last few years. Um, sort of a pro the focus on children's rights to privacy and their rights in the digital environment are still quite fragmented, but gaining a lot more attention in the UK and across Europe. As I mentioned, there's concerns around implementation, lack of harmonization within and across countries. Um, and just one conclusion to sort of end with is that I think what's been really important in a lot of these initiatives from the EU in the UK is the sort of commitment to children's involvement in the development of the uh, guidance um, and recommendations for member states and sort of learning from their experiences of views of, you know, what it means to live in a digital world now, I think has helped to really inform and drive this agenda. So I'll end there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Louise, for that um, elaborate uh, presentation of the Europe European context and uh, giving us the institutional setup and uh, also the um, legal framework that supports the right um, to privacy and putting it um, in the context of, of children's um, of, on children's rights. Um, it's, it's very important to look at these um, perspectives from other continents for the purposes of, of, of comparing um, with the African continent, how, how far we have gone and uh, also to try and identify where we can draw lessons from. We are very much aware that um, the African continent is still lagging behind in this area of privacy and data protection and there's so much to draw from, from the European experience. And uh, Prof. Julia has already taken us through the African context and given us a very rich overview of the situation in, in Africa and also touched on some of the uh, relevant um, instruments uh, on, uh, on, on privacy and data protection on, on the continent and also made reference to general comment number 25, which I think is one instrument that we need to really engage with. And she has also provided very elaborate um, recommendations that we will find in the reports that will be shared um, in due course. So in this discussion, we thought it was very uh, crucial to uh, profile a country context and um, uh, zero in on one of the um, African countries and see what the experience has been with regards to children's rights to privacy. And we are going to have a profile of the South African situation and uh, we'll have a, discuss a brief discussion on the impact of the Protection of Personal Information Act, which is South Africa's data protection law. And also um, just to note that South Africa is one of those countries that has a data protection authority. And uh, we'll also hear from the speaker um, what the data protection authority has done 
with regards to uh, children's rights to privacy. And to take us through this um, South African situation, we have uh, Ms. Um, um, Solar Vashar, and uh, she's uh, an admitted attorney specializing in ICT and privacy law. And she has served in the Office of the Public Protector and has also been appointed as Master of, of the High Court. She has also headed the Legal Directorate with the uh, Department of Employment and Labor and, and uh, Workmen's Compensation. And uh, she is currently um, the executive leading the legal policy um, research and information technology analysis within the um, information regulator, the information regulator being the um, data protection authority of, of South Africa. She is also um, above all this that she's doing, she's also a doctoral candidate um, in ICT law and privacy at the University of South Africa and also engaged with internet governance programs. So, um, uh, Ms. Vasha, over to you. Um, you have 10 minutes to give us a picture of what is happening in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, before I start sharing my screen, just as an, as an opening remark to say that privacy is a fundamental human right that is central to personal autonomy and dignity. And particularly now when you look at privacy and how critical it is as we navigate digital transformation. Um, the position of children's privacy in the digital environment is fraught with numerous challenges. And, and, and thus you see a growing, um, a growing global call for regulatory intervention. And I'm going to unpack the provisions in POPIA that relate to children. Um, just give me a second. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Um, just to very briefly introduce the information regulator, we were established in terms of Section 39 of uh, the Protection of Personal Information Act. Uh, we are a juristic person and we have national jurisdiction. We are independent, subject only to the Constitution, and we are accountable to the National Assembly. The information regulator is one of, uh, one of very few global regulators that are responsible uh, for both the protection of personal information and the promotion of access to information. So we have a dual a regulatory mandate, and I'm very mindful of the fact that we have, I just have 10 minutes. So um, we, we, we espouse both the right to privacy and the right of access to information. And I think it's, it's necessary for us to mention that children require particular attention um, when it comes to the protection of personal information, as, as more often than not, they are the most vulnerable uh, when it comes to the infringement of their right to privacy. I'm going to just be, briefly speak about uh, the key role players in terms of the Protection of Personal Information Act, uh, POPIA. Uh, I'm not going to go through what a data subject is and who a responsible party is, but in terms of POPIA, um, a child is defined as a natural person under the age of 18 uh, who is not legally competent um, and cannot make decisions without the assistance of a competent person to take any action or decision in respect of any matter concerning him or herself. And a competent person is uh, defined as any person who is legally competent to consent to any action or decision um, that's being taken in respect of a matter concerning a child. And you'll find throughout um, this piece of legislation, uh, the role of the competent person um, is, 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 is defined. When we look at the specific provisions in terms of POPIA, uh, I'm going to unpack them uh, very briefly. Section 4.4 requires that um, the processing of personal information of a child is prohibited unless uh, the provisions of 27 to 33 are applicable or if the regulator has granted prior authorization in terms of section 35.2 subject to the provisions of 37. Um, and and it's, it's, it's important for us to be mindful of the conditions for lawful processing of personal information. And these are very briefly are accountability, processing limitation, purpose specification, further processing limitation, information quality, openness, security safeguards, and data subject participation. 
So the overriding um, premise would be when you're processing personal information of children, that these conditions are, um, are, um, are considered. Moving on to 4.5, um, it requires that the processing of special personal information of a child is prohibited in terms of section 26 and 34, unless, again, the provisions of 27 and 35 are applicable. Um, and here again, you'll find that the act requires for the conditions to be applied uh, and complied with. Um, section 11.1 requires that personal information may of a child may only be processed if the data subject or competent person consents uh, to this processing. And I mean, I see, I've seen a lot of questions in the chat group about how does this happen and, and how, do you, how, how do you engage with the child to make sure that they fully comprehend um, this, this scenario. 12 to b um, further requires that the data subject or a competent person where the data subject is a child um, must have consent to the collection of information if it is going to be from another source. And 14.1D proceeds to state that the data subject or a competent person where the data subject is a child should have consented to the retention of the record um, regarding the personal information of children. And then we go on to 15.3A, which also requires um, that there has to be consent if there is going to be further processing of personal information of a child, which will not be compatible with the initial purpose of, connect, of collection. And as you can see, these resonate with the, with the lawful conditions of processing of personal information. 18.4 um, states that it's not necessary for a responsible party to comply with, notifi with the notification requirements that are contained in the Act if the data subject or competent person where the data subject is a child has provided consent. So as you can see, consent is a central, um, is, is, a, is a central principle throughout this piece of legislation. Moving on now to section 32, um, 32.1c and 32.1d. This states, um, overall that you are unable to process personal information concerning a data subject's health or sex life as unpacked in section 26, uh, which, which does not apply to the processing of information by insurance companies, medical schemes, medical scheme administrators, and managed healthcare organizations. Um, if such processing is necessary for firstly, if for schools, if such processing is necessary to render special support to pupils or making special arrangements in connection with um, a child's health or sex life. And secondly, if any public or private body which is managing the care of a child um, and if such processing is necessary for that public or private body to discharge their uh, lawful duties. Okay, the provisions, um, the further provisions which relate to the protection of personal information of children in POPIA um, are contained in sections 34 and 35 of POPIA. In, in section 34, it basically states that a responsible party may not process the personal information of children save for the following exceptions which are contained in in section 35 and, and i'm going to go through those very briefly with you firstly it would be if prior consent of a competent person which would be a parent or guardian is obtained um which which you've seen in in the other in the other sections of the act that have been discussed um secondly if processing is necessary for the establishment exercise or defense of a right or obligation in law um, if processing is necessary to comply with an international law obligation, such as those that have been discussed by other speakers, um, if processing is vital for historical, statistical, or research purposes. And, and there's a proviso to this because the processing must not adversely affect the privacy of the data subject disproportionately. It must serve a public interest and consent um, should have been possible or, or would have required a disproportionate effort to secure. 
um, should should it have been sought. And um, in terms of 35E, personal information must have been made public deliberately by the child with the consent of a competent person. And, and, and this can be quite a grainy area because particularly when you see um, when, when children interact on, on social media, for instance, on Instagram, TikTok, and Snapchat, how often is it that children have actually secured um, that measure of consent? You, you know, it's, it's quite a nebulous area, and a lot of advocacy work has to go into, the, into this. And I think it's critical that parents um, are aware of the type of social media applications that are out there, what you know and, and to have this discussion an open discussion with their children as to which social media applications do they engage with um and 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 make it a friendly discussion so you understand what your children um are, which applications your children are using and you as a parent um, you, you can educate yourself as to the risks at, associated with each of these um applications when it comes to um, the prior authorization, in terms of Section 35.2, um, the regulator may by notice in the Gazette authorize a responsible party to process the personal information of children, provided it is satisfied that the processing, again here you'll see, is in the public interest and that appropriate safeguards have been put in place to protect the personal information of a child. Um, and, and in this regard, the regulator can impose reasonable conditions in respect of these authorization applications and 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 these conditions would be to satisfy the regulator that um that the information of children will be adequately secured and to further unpack what um this would include the the in terms of section 35 2 you could the authorization which has been granted which may include information on how a responsible party on the request from a competent person will firstly they will have the ability to review how that personal information is processed refuse permission to the responsible party to further process personal information of a child um, to furnish a notice relating to the nature of how personal information of children is being processed um, to also ascertain how the personal information is processed and and to ascertain any further processing um, practices related to children's information. So this is basically what Section 35.3 of POPIA requires, and the regulator may impose conditions um, linked to this. Um, the regulator may impose conditions on a responsible party to firstly ensure that the responsible party will refrain from any action that is intended to encourage or persuade a child to disclose more personal information than is reasonably necessary for them to disclose. Um, when, and I think what is, what is critical is to ascertain what was the purpose of collection and to make sure that um, personal information prescribes to the minimality uh, provisions of the Act. The regulator may also impose conditions which would establish and maintain reasonable procedures to protect the integrity and confidentiality of the personal information collected from children. With regards to cross-border transfer of personal information of children, um, in terms of Section 571D, should the personal information of a child be transferred to another country that fails to provide an adequate level of protection during the uh, during the processing of such personal information, then it's going to be necessary for that responsible party to secure prior authorization um, from, from the regulator. If, if we're looking at the steps that the regulator has, has undertaken thus far in a bid to protecting the personal information of children, uh, as a start, the regulator has published a guideline on the processing of personal information of children um, and there is an associated um, application form for that. Um, and we will be publishing very shortly a guideline on what will constitute um, adequ an adequate level of protection for the processing of personal information, not just for children, but broadly um, of all, of both children and um, for all, all data subjects. 
The regulator will um, is seeking to create awareness amongst public and private stakeholders on how to protect and respect the rights of children in the digital sphere and to encourage the promotion of these rights. Um, if, if, um, if we have to reflect on the best interests of the child, this has to be central to, to our uh, stakeholder engagements. And it's a critical part of our engagements. I think it's going to be also necessary for us to look at addressing how disparate and unequal digital access has actually become divisive in our society. And, and I think we have seen that more so now uh, during this global pandemic where children are unable to attend school and, and those which don't have digital access have been basically barred from learning. And, and, and this kind of disparate and, and, une and unequal access is, is, has to be addressed um, by, by our state and, and other collaborative partners. And, and again, I just would like to say that the protection of children's rights, particularly um, in, 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 this, in the digital sphere, has to be a collaborative effort. And I think in, in conclusion, I'm just going to, to reflect on, on, on an extract from the State uh, World's Children um, Report by UNICEF. And they outline six priority actions, um, which I think we can all take to heart and, and, and look at in how we develop policies and, and how we deal with the protection of, um, of, of children. Firstly, to provide children with affordable access to high quality online resources. Um, the, to protect children from harm online, which would include abuse, exploitation, trafficking, cyberbullying, and exposure to unsuitable materials. Thirdly, to safeguard children's privacy and their identities online, to teach digital literacy, and to keep children informed, engaged, and safe online, and to leverage the power of the private sector to advance ethical standards and practices that protect and benefit children online, and to put children at the center of digital policy. I think, I think these six um, recommendations are, are beneficial for us to move forward um, as a country in protecting children's rights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, very informative uh, uh, presentation. We, we couldn't miss this because the, the POPI Act or the POPIA as we've come to know it in South Africa uh, came into force on the 1st of July. And for us, it was very important that we are able to deep, to dive into this, to, to single out or pick out some of those provisions that are applicable to children. Some of the issues that you raised, which of course I find them very, very interesting, was the, present, the, the slide that indicated the apps that you have to, make sure that you, you look at or uh, agree to, to censor those apps that go on your children's phone, on your child's phone and all whatnot. The truth is most of us do not even know these apps and our children seem to know it just like that without most of us as parents understanding uh, the context of these apps. So, but your presentation is calling us or uh, waking us up to look at uh, the apps more closely before we, we allow them on, the, on our children's gadgets or phones. Gadgets and phones, it's interesting to say, has become very, very popular in Africa, especially from last year, in the, and in the hands of our children that they begin to play with and that they also study with or study on. But now, because of time, I would like to encourage everyone, please drop your questions in the Q&A, but if you want to verbalize your question, you will have time for that at the end of all the presentations. So I will give you a chance to, to ask your question. And please, when you do that, identify yourself and indicate to whom you are addressing your question. It could also be to all the panelists. Our next presentation now from the government, from the national perspective, uh, we're now looking into the private sector because that is another sphere where we have our children uh, who could be in danger. And in the private sector, you look at so many other interactions or so many other uh, applications on the internet where our children are exposed to and the dangers that come from that area. For this, we have uh, Tina Paul. Tina, Tina is a senior analyst at Art Advisory, a public interest advisory firm that's out of us, a public interest advisory firm based in South Africa. Tina holds a BA, LLB, and LLM degrees from the University of Witts, Vatasran. 
And uh, before joining our advisory, Latina worked with uh, Section 27 in the matters relating to the rights to basic education. And some of us who follow this area of advocacy have known that Section 27 has done some great work around the country and first uh, getting uh, gradually into the continent as well. Thereafter, Tina uh, completed her articles of clerkship at the Legal Resource Center in Johannesburg, working on public law matters. Following her articles, Tina clerked at the Constitutional Court of South Africa. At Art of Advisory, Tina focuses on digital rights in Sub-Saharan Africa, with a focus on developing trends in the region. Her interest lies in the public law, online harms, uh, reductions, quality and non-discrimination and children's rights. Tina has conducted research on children's rights with focus on children's digital rights in Africa. And uh, she has also made a submission in this regard from uh, the UNCRC. For that, I think you are the most well-placed person to take us into what happens in the digital, in the, the private sector in terms of children's rights, the protection of children's rights to privacy and data protection. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. I'm just going to share my screen. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. And thank you so much to the Centre for setting up the session and for having me. I'm really excited to be part of this webinar along with this formidable and excitedly all female panel. I hope through the course of this webinar, we can debate some complex and contemporary issues and hopefully find some clarity around how best to ensure that children's privacy rights are protected in the digital sphere. For the next few minutes, I am going to unpack some of the considerations around children's privacy and data protection within the context of the private sector in South Africa. A few of the speakers have already begun to talk about these issues and a few of the questions that have been coming through indicate that this is quite a key issue for us to be discussing this morning. So I'll briefly begin with some reflections on the legal position. I will then highlight the ma major private sector actors in this context. Thereafter, I'm gonna address the more general positions taken by the private sector actors. And then I want to discuss two practical challenges that children are facing, particularly in South Africa, but I'm sure the position um, is replicated across the continent. The first relates to privacy policies, and this has been touched on briefly. I would also like to touch on some children's views in this regard. And then secondly, I would like, like to rely on a case study um, that South Africa is currently dealing with around accountability and how you hold multinational corporations accountable. I will then conclude with some recommendations. So the legal position in South Africa is fairly straightforward. South Africa is a party to several international and regional human rights treaties, including the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the Conventions of the Rights of the Child. Uh, regionally, South Africa has ratified the African Charter on Human and People's Rights and has ratified the Charter on the Rights and the Welfare of the Child. All of these conventions speak either to children's rights or to privacy or to both. So internationally, South Africa has undertaken to respect both children's rights and the right to privacy. South Africa's constitution also expressly recognizes both children's rights and the right to privacy. Notably, South Africa's constitution in section eight envisages horizontal application of the Bill of Rights, which means that private actors are also bound by the Bill of Rights. So from this position, it's quite clear that private sector actors must ensure that children's rights and the right to privacy is protected. We then have our data protection legislation, PAPIA, which Vasha has given us a really helpful um, overview of. And again, private sector actors in this context, context also have legal duties in relation to the processing of personal information of children. I did see that there have been some questions in the Q&A around identifying children in the media, as well as children and surveillance. And there are some really interesting resources on this. So if anyone is interested, I'm very happy to, to share those as well. More recently, and as noted by Prof uh, Slot Nielsen, a noteworthy amendment has been proposed in the Children's Amendment Bill, which seeks to provide for children's rights to privacy and the protection of their personal information. 
But while this is a really welcome inclusion, particularly in the digital era, and as more of our lives move online and children do need further protections, particularly online, there have been some submissions, notably by Media Monitoring Africa, on how this section in the Children's Amendment Bill could be better advanced and to ensure that children's rights to privacy are respected, protected and promoted both on and offline, and that any person or entity processing the personal information of the child must adopt privacy policies for such purpose, and such policies must be child friendly. And I will go into more detail with that. And if anyone is interested, we can also make those submissions available. So the legal position in South Africa is, is fairly clear, but regrettably, and as is often the case, the implementation isn't always as simple. And there are some sort of concerns. Firstly, there's a, a lack of requirement for children's rights impact assessments. And in terms of the general comment that has been discussed this morning, as well as other international standards, this is becoming an increasing trend, which South Africa doesn't appear to have adopted yet. And there is a bit of a disconnect between the law and the reality, which we will touch on. So we, we know that the legal position is clear and we know that children are online. Um, prof, um, so ev everyone has sort of sort of touched on the role of social media and the role of children being online and actually just knowing more about these devices and these apps than we do. So I've just unpacked a few of the key ones that are primarily used in South Africa and by children. So we have our social media platforms and messaging apps, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Twitter, TikTok. We then have our gaming platforms and our streaming sites. This is Twitch, Caffeine TV, Facebook Gaming, YouTube, Stream, and Epic Games. We then have search engines like Google. And increasingly, in particular in light of COVID, a lot of learning is taking place online. And we have educational platforms like Extra Marks, Chrism, um, Curo, Brainline, and Impact. And all of these services or apps or platforms are being used by children at an increasing rate. As more and more children become capable of accessing online spaces, these are quite common spaces that we would find children interacting these days. In 2019, UNICEF and Global Kids Online published a study in which they unpacked children's online participation. And this table provides a really useful overview of the ways in which children in South Africa are engaging with online opportunities and accessing and sharing information. And it's also clear from the table that there are multiple ways in which children are engaging, but you can see that the latter part of the table does speak more specifically to gaming or social media or messaging or music or videos and things like that. So we do know that children are in these spaces and we do know that these spaces are developed and monitored and run predominantly by private sector actors. So then begs the question, what is the position of private sector actors? So most, if not all, of the private sector actors I listed above, to some degree, have age restrictions, parental controls, or privacy statements or terms and conditions that relate to children or minors in some or other way. For example, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Twitch do not allow children under the age of 13 on their platforms and will move accounts of minors if they are reported to them. There are also several options for parental controls, such as tag review options on Facebook, controls for Facebook Messenger Kids app. Instagram has a comprehensive guide for parents on how to manage privacy interactions and time on Instagram. TikTok has a family pairing option which allows parents to link their own account to that of their child and also enable certain parental controls. So while I'm sure many parents are excited about these options, it is also important to, to bear in mind the evolving capacities of children and ensuring that children are active participants in decisions that affect them as required by international, regional and domestic law. So when grappling with the private sector, we also need to consider the role of parents and caregivers, as well as the role of children and how these all interact together to ensure that children are protected and respected and promoted and their rights are, are upheld both on and offline, but also that they are part of the process. Which takes us to our first practical challenge. And this relates to privacy policies, terms of service and community standards. And here we've included a quote from submissions made by BNA Monitoring Africa um, on General Coming 25 when it was still on draft form. We have recently, through a project led by Media Monitoring Africa, uh, myself along with my colleagues, have reviewed the privacy policies, terms of service, and community standards of several of the most common social media platforms and online platforms. And despite being qualified lawyers with quite a few years of experience, 
The policies were not easy to understand. The language was often misleading and it generally required us to read the policy more than once in order for us to fully ascertain what was being agreed to. And these concerns become even more pressing when it comes to children and pose really interesting questions around children's participation and their ability to consent, which is something that has also come through in the discussions this morning. So agreeing to unruly and incomprehensible terms and conditions and consenting to accessing certain content due to age restrictions may impact the ability of children to participate in line, online. And while we do acknowledge that some of the platforms are working to enhance this, we've noted Facebook's privacy basics has evolved and they are trying to make it more interactive and user friendly. The contracts, ultimately, the, the policies that people and children sign onto are complicated and they do raise concerns for children's privacy rights and data protection. Last year, we worked with a group of children, so Health Advisory Media Monitoring Africa and children from the Web Rangers program got together to unpack children's digital rights online. And collectively, we drafted what we now refer to as a digital rights charter, which seeks to give effect to an internet that is accessible, safe and empowering, and that advances the development of children's rights online. And one of the key things that came out from this, and this was a quote taken from the charter that was developed by children, was their concerns around terms and conditions and policies and what they wanted to see them be like. So when we are understanding the role of private sector actors in relation to children and their involvement online, it's also really important to understand what children are hoping for and how they want to interact. The second practical challenge that we are faced with is quite concerning. Uh, last year, a young girl in South Africa received anonymous threats of gang rape and murder over Instagram. In an attempt to obtain information about the perpetrator in order to protect herself, she and her family became caught up in what has been, um, been described as an intercontinental administrative quagmire in order to compel Facebook to disclose the identity of the holders of the several in Instagram accounts that were used to, to issue the threats to this young girl. Facebook refused to disclose the identity and the South African offices of Facebook refused to accept legal service of the papers, which meant that the young girl and her family needed to find lawyers in America so that they could serve papers in California. Now the lawyers have approached the High Court and it appears that the matter is going to be set down in August this year. And while this matter is still in a nascent stage and it's unclear whether or not it will result in a judgment as there may be an option for settlement, it does illustrate the really practical difficulties of holding state actors to account. And this is something that Prof. Slots Nielsen uh, referred to um, in her report. And it's just one of the really practical challenges that we will need to consider. We'll need to understand in South Africa what the scope is of Poppy in relation to these multinational corporations. We'll need to understand what role different regional bodies can play in holding big corporations to account. And we need to be able to strike that balance of ensuring that young children are protected and their rights are protected whilst ensuring that organizations are, are held to account should there be rights violations. And while I have several recommendations and have been really excited by the discussions already today, I just have a few that I would like to take you through. The first relates to states. Uh, states do have a responsibility to ensure that private actors are, are acting appropriately and in line with uh, international, regional and domestic law and need to ensure that there is appropriate implementation, compliance and enforcement. We also recommend that the private sector actors should adopt child-centric policies. We then reiterate the recommendation from the children of web rangers. And we also suggest that there should be default privacy settings for any collection and processing and storage. And as noted earlier, we would encourage states to make it a requirement for child's rights impact assessments to be conducted whenever there is any chance of children's rights being implicated. So with that being said, I would like to, to conclude and just say thank you. And if there are any additional resources or discussions or questions, I'm more than happy to, to address them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tina, for that uh, very elaborate uh, presentation and also zeroing in on the on the South African context. Um, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that uh, we are running out of time. So um, quickly going to introduce our next speaker. So in 2014, the African Union adopted the 
uh, Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection. This is a continental instrument on data protection, but unfortunately, um, uh, since 2014, only a few countries um, have ratified this instrument and it has not yet come into force. So um, they, uh, so we we are going to hear the 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 um, the, the discussion on this convention um, from the perspective of children's rights. And uh, to contextualize this within the discussion that we are having today, we have uh, Miss Opal Masocha. And uh, Ms. Opal Masocha is a human rights lawyer. She has a, a, a master's degree in um, uh, human rights and democratization in Africa from the Center for Human Rights, um, University of Pretoria. She's currently based at the um, Committee of Experts on the Rights of the Child. She's part of the Secretariat as a legal researcher. Um, Ms. Opal, please, uh, let me give you the opportunity to contextualize for us this convention um, on on um, on cyber security and, and personal data protection, and um, why is it necessary for countries to ratify this instrument? Thank you. Thank you very much, Tenyue. Um, please confirm if you can see my screen. Um, Opal, your voice projection is very low. Can you hear me now? Yes, please. please. Okay, thank you very much. Please confirm if you can see my screen. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, greetings everyone. My name is Opal and it's a pleasure for me to be making this presentation. So for the next 10 minutes, hopefully I'll be contextualizing the AU Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection through the lens of children's rights to privacy and data protection in a digital sphere in Africa. So um, in terms of the presentation structure, I'll start by giving an introduction, which will be followed by a background of the AU Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection, which I'll be referring to as the Malabo Convention. After that, I'm going to talk about the protection of the rights to privacy and personal information in the Malabo Convention and then I'll end by giving a conclusion and recommendations. So in terms of the introduction, uh, we all know that the increase in the use of technology has created opportunities for children, but however, the internet also creates challenges and threats to children's rights, including the right to privacy. So when we are talking about children, we see that due to their age and lack of knowledge, they are unaware of the various threats to privacy online and therefore they remain at risk, hence the need for the legal protection of their rights to privacy online. As highlighted by um, Prof. Sloth, Article 10 of the African Children's Charter provides for the protection of children's rights to privacy. And we also note that there are four principles underlining the protection of children's rights. That is the best interest of the child, non-discrimination, um, life survival and development, as well as, um, sorry, Okay, I'm sorry. So as highlighted by Prof. Sloth, um, Article 10 of the African Children's Charter provides for the protection of children's right to privacy. And we also note that there are four principles that um, underpin children's rights, which are the best interests of the child, non-discrimination, life survival and development, as well as child participation. However, the adoption of the African Children's Charter predates the advent of the internet, hence the need for the protection of children's rights in the digital context. In that regard, we see that the Malabo Convention tackles the issue of privacy and data protection in Africa. Just a brief background. Um, this Malabo Convention was adopted on the 27th of June, 2014 at Malabo in um, Equatorial Guinea. The goal is to address the need for harmonized legislation in the area of cybersecurity and establish mechanisms capable of combating violations of privacy that may be generated by data collection, processing, among other things. As highlighted before, this convention has been ratified by eight countries, which are listed in the screen, and the convention will only enter into force upon ratification by 15 countries, and this is in terms of Article 36 of um, the convention. So when we are looking at um, privacy and data protection in the Malabo Convention, we see that this is provided for in um, chapter two of the convention, 
So we also note that the convention has no explicit provisions um, on children's privacy and data protection, but the provisions on personal data protection apply to children because when we are talking about human rights, this also involves um, children. So in terms of um, Article 8, sorry, um, I wrote section, but it's supposed to be article. So in terms of Article 8, um, sub Article 1 and 2, um, the convention actually requires states to establish legal frameworks aimed at protecting physical data and punish violations to privacy. And in terms of that article, any form of data processing should respect fundamental freedoms and rights. And in respect of children, this provision implies that the legal frameworks adopted by member states should also protect children's privacy and protect their personal data. And the provision further calls for the respect of fundamental rights of children in data collection and um, processing. So in addition to this provision, the Malabo Convention sets out six basic principles governing the processing of personal data. And this also applies to the processing of children's data. So we have um, the principle of consent and legitimacy of personal data processing, the principle of lawfulness and fairness of personal data processing, the principle of purpose, relevance, and storage of processed um, personal data, we have the principle of accuracy of personal data, the principle of transparency of personal data processing, as well as confidentiality and security of personal data. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about all these principles, but I'm going to dwell mostly on the first principle and um, principle number five. So when we're looking at the principle of consent and let you know that the convention provides for the need for the data subject to give their consent for the processing of personal data. And in terms of the convention, consent of the data subject is defined as any manifestation of express, unequivocal, free, specific and informed will given by the data subject by his or by his or her legal representative. As such, it is noted that the Malabo Convention does not expressly um, provide for the requirement to obtain parental consent, which is quite problematic in my view. I would say that this convention should have explicitly provided for parental consent and establish an age threshold that is specific in that regard. I believe requiring parental consent um, represents progress to a certain extent because without such a requirement, neither internet service providers nor website operators, that is the data controllers are required to take into account the age of the users when they notify that the processing of personal data is uh, taking place or when they request users consent. And this might be a threat to children's privacy and against um, the best interest of the child. So when you're looking at this um, requirement of parental consent, I would also say that it is important because it, fed, uh, it further reinforces um, uh, the role of parents in the protection of children's rights in the African Children's Charter as the provision on privacy stipulates that parents or legal guardians shall have um, the right to exercise reasonable supervision over the conduct of their children. And further, Article 20, sub-Article 1 of the Charter further provides that parents or other persons responsible for the child shall have the primary responsibility for the upbringing and development of the child. And in that regard, whilst the requirement for consent is notable, the requirement for parental consent should have been expressly provided for so as to protect the rights of the children. Now, when we're talking about principle five um, on transparency of personal data processing, this principle requires mandatory disclosure of information on personal data by the data controller. And in that regard, or rather in regard to children, this implies that all companies and public authorities that collect and process personal data should actually provide information to data subjects, that is the users, and this includes children, in a concise, transparent, intelligible, and easily accessible form using clear and plain language in particular for any information that is addressed specifically to a child. So um, when we look at these six principles and from a child rights perspective, we know that governments should therefore adopt legislation 
or put in place policies that require internet service providers, search engines, social media networks, and other providers of internet enabled content and, service, and services to provide children with proper information adapted to their capacities about the processing of their personal data and their rights as data subjects. So um, again, it is also important to note that the convention provides for the rights of a data subject and children are also included as they are also data subjects. And amongst those rights, we have the right to information, which is in terms of Article 16, the right to access in terms of Article 17, the right to object in terms of Article 18, and then we also have the right of rectification or erasure in terms of um, Article 19. So again, in the interest of time, I'm going to talk about or focus mainly on the right of rectification or erasure. So when we look at Article 19 of the convention, um, any national person may demand that the data controller rectify, complete, update, or erase the personal data concerning them where such data are inaccurate, incomplete, or whose collection use, disclosure, or storage are prohibited. This right, in fact, works much more as a means to protect other rights, such as privacy and reputation, than as a right in itself. In this respect, such remedy, we can say, could ensure that children do not suffer serious long-term consequences simply because they lack a full understanding of the risk involved in sharing personal information online. For instance, children may post images of themselves in embarrassing um, situations, or their parents may post images without the children's consent, which may result in serious reputational damage. So um, as children grow into adults, the consequences of being unable to erase regrettable content from the internet and thus from public view can be severe. So therefore, when um, we are talking about children, this right of erasure um, could actually be used not as a right in itself, that is to delete any information from the web, but also as a tool to protect children where their privacy, their reputation or other rights are violated and no better solution exists um, to stop the violation. Um, it is also important to note that the convention uh, provides, um, has criminal provisions or rather offenses specific to ICTs and of particular importance, we have Article 29, sub Article 2, Paragraph E, which requires states to criminalize the processing of personal data without complying with the pre uh, preliminary formalities for the processing. And from a child rights perspective, the collecting and processing of children's data without the consent of their parent or legal guardian would be an offense in that regard. Um, of also particular importance is Article 29, sub Article 3, Paragraph 1, sub Paragraph A to D, which also requires states to take legislative or regulatory measures to criminalize child pornography. Well, I know that some may think that when you're talking about child pornography, we're only talking about uh, child sexual abuse and exploitation, but I would say, or I believe that child pornography is an attack on children's privacy or um, an attack upon their uh, reputation, thereby infringing their right to privacy as provided by Article 10 of the African Children's Charter. So therefore this provision does not only protect children from sexual exploitation and, or exploitation and abuse, but it also protects children. Um, it also protects the rights um, to privacy of children in the digital context. So when we're looking at these criminal provisions, we see that they protect children, and this is in line with the provisions of the African Children's Charter, which state that the child has the right to protection of the law against interference or attacks on their privacy, honor, and reputation. Lastly, um, we can note that the ad adoption of the Malabo Convention was a significant step towards the protection of personal data. In my view, however, I would say it would have been appropriate to have specific provisions on processing children's data as was done in the EU General Data Privacy Regulation. So when we look at the EU GDPR, we see that it explicitly recognizes that children deserve their personal data to be specifically protected 
as they may be less aware of the risks, the consequences and safeguards consent and their rights in relation to the processing of personal data. And this is um, in respect of um, recital 38. So I believe children due to their vulnerability need specific or particular attention as was highlighted by Ms. Vasha. And this includes the express provisions on their right to privacy and data protection in the digital sphere. Nevertheless, as I have mentioned before, the provisions of the Malabo Convention actually apply um, in the um, ch children's rights context. And we can say that it can be held as a progressive step towards the protection of children's privacy in the digital sphere, something which is not comprehensively addressed or which is not adequately um, provided for in the African Children's Charter. So now, given that it has been since year, um, seven years since the Malabo Convention was adopted, but not yet in force, it is recommended that the African countries should ratify the Malabo Convention. And we know that it's only not about ratification. After ratifying the convention, um, state parties are required to domestic the provisions of the convention and ensure the implementation thereof, so as to create a safe online environment for children. That is the end of the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Opal. And thank you for, for wrapping up in a very, very good way. As we have said in many, uh, several of our webinars, uh, time is an issue. It is always an issue with webinars where we get to the point to discuss intensive issues and we can't because of time. But I want to thank the colleagues who have been responding to the, the questions that we have, because now we are in the Q&A section. I will, we will take maybe one or two questions because of time so that we can wrap up. As we indicated from the start, we at the center are building a repository on this issue at the level of the continent. And uh, in the years to come or months to come, we are looking forward to, to doing something great with most of these reports that we have now keeping. But if we, if you want to verbalize your question again, you could raise your hand and keep it very, very short. But otherwise, I would like to ask the, the panelists and this uh, maybe to all of them in terms of giving as well their final words on this before we move to, to the wrap up, is that based on your experience in your different fields, do you think and especially looking at the issue, I think that uh, Tina also flagged in her presentation on the issue of uh, evolving capacity of the child, uh, uh, that the last two years, or maybe 2020, where we had a huge penetration to internet and uh, in terms of education and many other things, that do we need to have an age indicator where a child will or could be allowed to access some of this app? Or do you think parents really, really have control in this, in this, uh, in this environment? I will start with uh, Prof. Julia briefly. Thank you. Thanks, Elvis. Um, from from the available international literature, there's quite a big word of caution um, that gets expressed about bright line age categories. So I, I think that's quite a difficult question. Um, to, to, to answer um, comprehensively, the, as, as Louise, if she's still here, will, will confirm the age that's provided for in the European um, context is 16, although countries could specify 13 by 2018 if they wanted to. But um, I think those, those would be uh, challengeable based on children's evolving autonomy and based also on different contexts in which children access um, social media, which could be in relation to their schoolwork, which could be in relation to, could be at school, if schools reopen, once schools reopen. Um, it could be in their homes, it could be out with their friends in the park. So I don't think that a bright line age determination is an easy one to make in seeing a juxtaposition to children's evolving autonomy but I'm interested to hear other perspectives. Thank you. Louise? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to come in and um, firstly agree with um, Professor Slotnielsen's comments about how challenging it is to set 
you know, hard um, age restrictions or um, limits on different services. But I just wanted, I'll share in the chat, um, there's been some interesting work done by um, a civil society organization called the Five Rights Foundation around, you know, how, how can you tell that a user of a service or an app or whatever is a child? And um, they've done a lot of research into sort of the pros and cons of different approaches to doing that. So I will share that in the chat. Um, uh, Ms. Vasha? Hi, um, you know, I, I've got to concur with both, uh, um, with both um, Louise and, and Prof, because it, it's really going to be difficult considering the disparate ages that you'll see, um, you know, as per associate with different regions. I think, I think it's a quicker win if parents can converse with their children and, 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 and try to engage with them um, as to, you know, which are the platforms that they're engaging and, and to go through this whole digital um, discourse together. And I, I think that would be a quicker win. Um, thank you. Tina? Sure, Prof. I don't have much more to add than, than what has already been said. We have shared some resources in the chat function to assist parents and caregivers as they work through these issues with children, but I echo the similar cautions raised by the previous speakers. I think strict age categories can, can be a concern, but there can also be concerns when you don't recognize children's evolving capacities and set everything for over the age of 18, and that's also a balance that needs to be struck. Before we move to the last, uh, to the, to Opal, just want to indicate that we'll make the recording available and that we'll continuously be in touch as we, as we develop this area in children's rights jurisprudence that is still very, very, very young in our beloved continent. Opal. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have um, nothing much to add and I would say that I concur with the previous speakers and maybe um, emphasize or highlight the importance of um, the evolving capacities of, capacities of children and say that um, parents in that regard should actually, you know, play a role in supervising or monitoring the children's activities online in line with their evolving capacities. Thank you very much. The supervision of children online remains a very, very topical issue. But as we develop this area of uh, children's rights jurisprudence on our continent, I'm very sure that with the expertise that we have at the level of the center and with the colleagues that we collaborate with some are here, we will be able to, to do something uh, that will be appreciated by the continent going forward. I will now hand over to my colleague, Klingi Wen. Klingi, are you there? There you go. I am Elvis. Um, thank you so much for the thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, and thank you so much for the speakers for the uh, presentation, elaborate presentations and uh, um, the comments from from the chat section. I mean, a lot of issues have been raised. There are issues around surveillance, um, issues around um, parental balancing uh, between parental guidance and children's um, autonomy. Um, also um, issues around um, state surveillance and how uh, children's issues fall within that, that spectrum. And also um, other comments are around advocacy, the importance of advocacy and um, how we relate commercial uh, privacy um, to manuscripts with children's uh, pictures. Um, all those issues have, have been raised um, during the chat. I'm sure you realize that this is a very broad conversation and. Um, that we cannot adequately cover within the time that has been um, allocated. But I think we have tried to cover a lot of issues and also um, the, the country context. Um, in, in closing, I just want to call upon our assistant director, uh, Dr. Nkata Murungi, uh, to close um, today's session. Thank you. Okay. Um. Thank you very much, Ken Yue and colleagues, um, panelists. Thank you very much for your uh, insightful contributions to the discussion. As I said, when we started, we 
we are very much aware that we can only really scratch the surface of this discussion, given the time that we have. And we were trying as much as possible to not ex exceed um, the, the time that we say we will finish so that we can have all, all of your attention. I think, uh, again, uh, you will agree, and as Klingyu has mentioned some of that, and as the panelists have also um, come back to some of the issues that arose, that we have had a range of issues that um, I think in, I can mention some of them in, in very brief terms, but which we hope um, in the next steps, which I will articulate of how we proceed to, how we plan to proceed with this project, we'll be able to come back to. I think one of the main things that comes out of this work is, or out of this discussion, is the comparability um, of the reality and challenges or related to children's uh, 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 privacy in the data con in the uh, digital context within the African region, and the need to re respond to that. I think that is a recurring theme, even from the the report that Professor Sloth Nielsen shared uh, earlier on. Um, the question of mapping and identity, I mean, identifying, mapping the role of stakeholders and um, knowing how to engage with them from a point of accountability. I think that is a conversation that we started from last year. We'll still continue, particularly engaging the role of governments as primary principal duty bearers for children's rights, but especially also private actors and how we bridge conversations between those two groups. And ultimately, children themselves, socializing children to understand what their rights are and how to get uh, protections for them for themselves. There is a whole issue around standard setting, uh, not so much about norm, new norms, because we seem to have new uh, a lot of normative instruments, but standard setting from a norm interpretation point of view that uh, still needs to happen at the regional and national levels, and especially harmonization of of those standards related to protection of children in a digital context. That is a theme that is very clear and that we also uh, hope and continue to work on in the next uh, few months as we develop this work a little bit more. And finally, the is that we are doing this, but also realizing that we are actually in a, working in a context that is very highly uh, paced. You know, the rate of evolution of this digital context is so highly paced that we have to keep up with developments that come up every day. So the, the challenges really do not dissipate and we have to adapt to that reality and work with it. Uh, from the center's point of view, our plan, and uh, I would want to just come back to that because it was the first question that was asked, will we receive this report? So this report um, is part of a wider project, which as I mentioned uh, again at the beginning and in our last year's webinar, we, had, we are having this major project to map uh, protection of children in the digital sphere uh, from an African point of view, so that we can, we can lead this conversation about contextualizing these issues to the region, uh, norm setting, uh, standards, uh, I mean, standard setting and harmonization conversations and engagement with stakeholders. So this study was supposed to provide us with a baseline uh, that would inform that work. So the study is now, as uh, Professor Sloth Nielsen said, we have had the first uh, draft of the study. We have done some reviews. It's really pretty much in the final stages of finalizing. Once it's finalized, it will be published and disseminated. We are hoping that once it has been finalized and disseminated, that it will then become a basis for us to engage more um, with all of you who are involved here from a point of view of stakeholders in this sector. So we will be having forums. We are hoping that um, this, the report will be a basis for convening uh, key actors in this area. It will be a basis for standard setting and it will be a basis also for engaging in a process of a regional uh, and establishing a regional guidance in, in partnership with the Committee on the Rights of the Child, I mean, the African Committee, but also other uh, role players in the region in relation to um, governance, inter internet governance and protection of children in the context of uh, digital rights. So yeah, so this, this is really the thinking in the broader sense. As I said again at the beginning, for the center, this is also within a broader conversation about technology and human rights. So please also engage with our work, the rest of our work in that, in that area. We are also dealing with technology in relation to children's rights, uh, rights of persons with disabilities, the rights of women, um, digital rights as, I mean, uh, and access to information, 
There is a lot of questions involved in that campaign and we welcome you to please engage with it. A lot of the questions that were raised here are questions that, of course, they plague all of us, thinking about how we actualize these rights, how do we make things, things relevant in an African context. We feel that the only way to do this is to, to have a long-term plan, a project that we work on these issues on a long-term basis. And that is what we are trying to do. So we are also welcome to partnerships and um, to hear from all of you in supporting this. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, in closing, I just want to say a big thank you to our panelists for all your time and your insights, the time you took to prepare for sharing your perspectives. We sincerely appreciate it. Thank you very much to each and every one of you. Uh, and we look forward to a continued engagement with you. Also to the participants, sincerely appreciate your time. Thank you for, for your interest in this subject matter and we hope that you continue to engage with us. As you may have seen, um, this recording is available so you can still refer to it. You can go back and um, you know, get a sense of what the discussions were at your own time. If you feel you need to reach out to us, reach out to us on you know, all the, the, the platforms that uh, the center operates through. You can, you can always uh, get in touch with us. We, we are happy to engage. But also uh, to thank the team behind putting together this webinar. Um, uh, my colleagues, Hengiwe, Elvis, and the other team members in those units, as well as the communications unit, Yolanda and uh, Tiruna and colleagues behind this, a uh, sincere word of thank you. And yeah, from my side, uh, everyone who has made this possible, sincerely appreciate your input. Keep well and see you again soon in the next webinar. Why?